Welcome to part two of the Iceland trip. We're going to be focusing on a geology field trip organized by GeoWorld Travel. Most people are pretty comfortable with the idea of continental drift, a mid-Atlantic ridge going north and spreading through the heart of Iceland and perhaps being responsible for the many volcanic features on the island. Many don't know though that there is a plume originating several thousand kilometers below in the mantle bringing very hot magmatic fluids right into the area where the spreading center is. These hot spots can generate volcanoes under glaciers. They can be associated with transform faults which are sidestepping. And the mantle plume itself migrates with time. So there's a lot going on here and it creates families of volcanic systems of which we're going to have a look at all the major ones around the island. We'll start in the southwest corner closest to Reykjavik and the Reykjanes Peninsula. Our driver Oscar will keep us from getting too lost. It's not far south from Reykjavik to where the mid-Atlantic ridge comes on shore. I covered this in my Iceland part 1 video so I won't do that again. But I will have another look at Grindavik and Blue Lagoon to the north. High resolution interference patterns between two satellite passes show a significant centimeters large bulge forming in the Blue Lagoon area. Very high resolution land based laser systems show a sawtooth pattern as the ground rises from magmatic injection and then a collapse after an eruption which is the pink coloration. More on that last rise at the end of the video. Seismographs pinpoint many low amplitude earthquakes culminating in an abundance and a greater amplitude just prior to the actual eruption. The summary of these methods allows a fairly accurate prediction as to where the eruption is going to take place. From the geothermal plant at the Blue Lagoon and its parking lot and lava flowing moving towards Grindavik, the area was under threat. A massive berm was quickly built around the town, which successfully diverted the lava. But the earthquake damage and infrastructure destruction has made the town uninhabitable, at least for the time being. Our next stop is touted as the bridge across the continents and is one of the largest extension fractures in Iceland. It's touted as having the two plates on both sides as they're spreading, but the reality is, is that when these plates spread, they create a graben field of many blocks, sometimes filling with water if it's underwater in the ocean. Not a single graben, but we do have the North American plate on our left hand side here, and it's about six kilometers across to the Eurasian plate. We continue along the Rift Valley system to Thingvellir. This massive rift valley is bordered by faults on both sides, dropping down 10 to 20 kilometers to a magma reservoir and has a lake and numerous bodies of water within it. This was the site of Iceland's annual parliament from the year 930 to 1798, the longest running in the world. A earthquake finally caused it to be moved to Reykjavik. Many stepped normal faults are easily seen here and the fractures are filled with water, very deep, very cold and clear and connected to the big lake. That eek sound is people scuba diving in dry suits along those narrow clear canyons. Our next stop along the same volcanic system is at Geyser, which gives its name to all the geysers around the world. Every few minutes when groundwater can't hold back superheated steam, the system depressurizes and then the two geysers here are the only erupting hot springs in Europe. Nearby geyser is Gullfoss or Gold Falls. Fed by Iceland's second largest glacier, Langjökull, it's made of three faults and is also unique in the only exposure we saw of sedimentary rock on our trip. The softer volcanically derived sediments were eventually overlain by harder resistant lava flows. Volcanoes and lava flows at the edge of the sea and under ice formed steep cliffs. Glacial rebound, uplift, sea retreat create perfect spots for waterfalls like Celia Landfoss and you can actually get behind this one. Now we're going to take a ferry to the Vestmanjar or the Westman Islands. This is an archipelago of over 80 different volcanic remnants of which only 18 rise above sea level. The reaction of volcanic ash and water create pelagonite. The softer rock erodes, creating multiple nesting sites for birds as we enter the harbor 
Due to unusual sea conditions, almost all of South Iceland's fishing fleet was in this harbour in 1973. From our bus stop viewpoint, we can see where the Edfell volcano behind us erupted flowing lava that covered 400 houses and threatened to close off the entire harbour trapping the fishing fleet. Massive pumps were set up pumping salt water against the lava which stopped the lava and saved the harbour. The Eld High Mar Museum in town does a great job describing the Pompeii of the north. The eruption lasted five months and increased the island's size by 20%. If you didn't know this history driving through now you wouldn't know this ever happened. With unusually good weather, we hiked to the top of Edfell. This gave a real sense of the immense sound and light and fury this eruption must have had on the town. Even now, over 50 years later, there are still hot vents coming up right through the volcano to the very top. This cold, clear weather gives us a great chance to see the marching chain of volcanoes all the way to the south, but we're going to go visit the heart of Edfell first. Lava bombs can still be found on the ground next to the commemorative cross placed at the dead center of the eruption. Thick ash layers almost look like sedimentary rocks. The migrating plume creating volcanoes at the seafloor is very similar to the Hawaii model. In this case we actually had a chance to witness the creation of a new volcanic island, Surtsey, off the furthest point to the south. The small flat distant island of Surtsey was created in 1963 and is now returning to the sea. One last look at the Pelagonite Cliffs in the harbour and its puffin nests and we say goodbye to the Westman Islands. We spend the night at Skogafoss Falls, one of the highest in Iceland and used in many TV and movie series. It forms along this extensive sea cliff line on the south coast which is host to many waterfalls. Iceland claims to have over 10,000 waterfalls and that's plenty to get away from the crowds of people that are at the more popular ones. Hexagonal honeycombed cooling columns is the iconic basaltic lava flow look in Iceland. These are beautifully seen at the rather dangerous due to rogue waves beach at Reynasviara. Erosion from the sea on the cliffs has exposed the beautiful internal columnar structures of the lava, which given enough time has cooled into perfect hexagons. A unique cave allows you to get underneath it and see it from below as well as from the side. Caution was advised as sudden waves have swept people out to sea as they were looking at the beautiful basalt columns. Tour leader James points out a classic Table Mountain, which is a volcano that erupted under ice. As we follow the old shoreline of sea cliffs, we stop at Mount Lamagnapur. Iceland's highest cliff at 767 meters. A uniquely Icelandic feature are the sand doors, the broad outwash plains formed from glacial meltwater. The mantle plume under Iceland can form volcanic hotspots anywhere. Iceland was completely covered by glaciers in the last ice age and still has Europe's second largest glacier. It also happens to be underlined by volcanoes. Whether they burn a hole through the ice or are trapped underneath, they emit immense volumes of rapidly moving water and sediments creating tremendous civil destruction to bridges and roads. The old lava fields are covered in a mossy heath, which look quite interesting but are quite dangerous because they hide areas that could collapse into caves. Our next stop at Svarty Voss Falls. It's about 20 meters high, flowing over columnar basalts, and is a fantastic spot for a photo op. We pass valleys with the remnants of the massive glacier Vatna Yokel and visit a lake. Glacial Lake Fjall Sarlon is at the south end of the Vatna Yokel Glacier. It's shallow, but shows the story of rapid glacial retreat. Large chunks of ice are still calving off and trapped and melting in the water. Now the sides are very well developed lateral moraines building up. From the distance of the moraines you can see the sand or outwash plains from the meltwater of the glacier. Nearby is Glacial Lake Jokulsarlan, very deep at 284 meters, allegedly the deepest lake in Iceland. The beautiful blue sculpted ice is trapped in the deeper water by a shallowing as the river enters the ocean. 
as the tides move the ice back and forth and it melts. It eventually gets shallow enough to escape the river and end up on the beach next door. This beach is called Eistri Felsfjara, also known though as Diamond Beach, which is unique because of the black sand contrasting against the blue and crystal clear ice from the glaciers. This is as pure and clean and fresh ice as you'll ever find anywhere. Uh, it's delicious. It's great in a glass of scotch. And the compressed air bubbles crackle as they escape. We're staying in Hoffen that night. We tried some fish snacks, which at the local gas station, uh, an acquired taste. Had a walk around the town and saw the beautiful glacier behind and noticed that there seemed to be a party going on. Everything was dressed up in orange with flagging and the neighborhood puts on a lobster fest with stew and beer handed out for free and a show. We just walked right into this. It was great fun. Most of the volcanic flows are black basalts, and so when we come across white rhyolites, which are more quartz-rich lava, we look at their interesting textures and speculate on a model that could create such a different rock. A summer road shortcut over a high pass allows us to see some interesting geology and visit the waterfall Folaldefoss with more rhyolites containing zeolites, another interesting mineral. And a side trip to the small fishing village of Jupi Bogor with its incredible collection of egg sculptures based on local birds. Europe's most powerful waterfall, Deti Foss. Well, it's more like Deti Fog today. This clip off the web will have to do instead. Which brings us to Lake Miva and its incredible amount of geologically interesting things in the area. The Krafla Caldera complex is about 800 square kilometers of historic and current volcanic activity. We're going to be visiting a number of these areas along its trend. The Haverir Hot Springs has been existing here for at least 11,000 years. Thermally heated steam rising through the ground reacts with shallow water. And microbes break down hydrogen sulfide gas, giving it the characteristic smell but also creating sulfuric acid which breaks the rock down into clays of many colorful altered colors. The result is a gooey colorful mix with gases gurgling and bubbling through the mud pots. Sulfur crystals precipitate out from the gas and some parts of these areas has been enough to be a commercial sulfur operation. Next door the fantastic extension fracture in the side of Namafiel Mountain makes for a great group photo shot. Looking down the valley of the complex, the geothermal activity is evident with the gathering lines for the geothermal plant. Fresh water is pumped down and steam flashed and gathered in turbines. The extremely hot wastewater, rich in blue silica, is either dumped into a local river or used for a free shower by the side of the road or gathered up for the Miva nature baths, which we visited. Smaller than the Blue Lagoon, Miva nature baths are fantastic, silica rich, don't get this spilt on your glasses, it says. But swim up bar, a lot of fun, and super hot water. It was a great way to get ready for our big day trip to Askia. The Foss Hotel where we stayed was appropriate between two lava flows, and the room was quite simple, and the breakfast had a great cod liver oil shooter. Perfect after my dried fish snacks. Our jacked up bus was perfect for this kind of a trip on an unpaved road through some pretty rough lava territory. It shook a lot. Herdebreed, a tabletop volcano erupted under a glacier that formed a vertical, steep-sided mountain. We shook our way to our first river crossing. I wouldn't want to do this in the spring or after a lot of rain. And the rope we were supposed to stay close to had actually drifted downstream. I wonder how many people find out that their vehicles aren't quite high enough to clear the river as they do that crossing. The flag gets raised at the Warden's Hut as we are getting deep into the highlands of Iceland. We cross our first pumice field. Askia consists of three nested calderas along a spreading plate boundary with nearly 1800 eruptions in the last 7,000 years, most recent of which had half a kilometer high lava fountains. We are in where hell freezes over. The immense eruption in 1875 created so much devastation to the economy of Iceland, created a massive migration to Canada and northern United States. 
the collapse in caldera formed a hole taking more than 50 years to reach its full size 224 meters deep took 32 years for the water to fill adjacent to it which is what we're looking at here is a small crater that filled with hot enough water to actually be suitable for swimming mixed in with the typical heavy black basalts and volcanic clays are the light white pumice amid the rock that can actually float on water had so much entrained air in it. Here at the Drekakil Gorge, the pumice actually looks like petrified wood, has a fibrous woody texture to it. NASA brought its astronauts for the moon landing up here to think like geologists, and the new Artemis II astronauts visiting the moon in 2026 are training here. Back in Mitva, we see the Gotorgya cave, famous for its geothermal hot springs. Unfortunately, the magma chamber is about two kilometers under the cave, which makes the hot water too hot and too unpredictable for safe bathing. There are those still in the northern extension of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where the continental plates are spreading, so we can still push those plates apart. The Krafta caldera complex, this whole area of the geothermal springs, the nature baths, the hot springs, it's about a thousand square kilometers in size, and in the center of it is the VT crater. It erupted about 300 years ago. You can still hike up to the very top of it, walk along the rim of the crater, and look down the valley, the trend of all the various geothermal, volcanic hot springs. And it's interesting that the smaller craters that are uh, full of ash and um, debris are now being actively farmed. Um, probably very rich soil in there. The caves and lava tubes of Dimu Borgir, as we go through, have a long folkloric history as part of the culture of Iceland. As lava pooled over a small lake, the lava flowed across the wet soil and the marsh boiled, vaporizing, forming lava pillars up to several meters in size, including tubes of solidified lava. Nordic folklore says this is where heaven and hell meet. The same phenomena of lava flowing over moist ground as Skutis Gigar forms the rootless cones area. They look like little volcanoes, but they have no magma chamber or obvious source of volcanic activity. They are also, though, a great magnet for wildlife, wild birds, and flowers in the area. As we leave this amazing area, we visit Godfoss, or God's Falls which in addition to be a great waterfall through a 7,000 year old lava field is surrounded by great columnar jointing again in the adjacent rocks and within those joints you can see some nice horizontal layers showing the cooling effect. This has been an incredibly rich area between the mid-Atlantic ridge crossing through here and exiting through the north part of Iceland and the hot spots between Askia and Mitva. We're now on our way through Akuri the largest town in northern Iceland. The glacial valleys are smoother and older than other parts we've seen. And we visit our last old volcanic system, the Grabrock Volcano, which erupted almost 4,000 years ago. And it's the easternmost end of the Snaufelsnes volcanic zone, the last major volcanic zone of Iceland that we haven't visited. Adjacent to the volcano are sheep pens made by stacking basalt rocks and in the background are some beautiful columnar basalts in the cliff face. At the end of our field trip, clearly the ground data showed that magma insertion was occurring and that the earthquake activity between Grindavik and Blue Lagoon was showing that something was impending within a week. The eruption had started and I hired Nature Eye, which is a drone service that allows you to fly a drone over the lava fields from the safety and convenience of your own computer. Fitting closure to the volcanologist dream GeoWorld tour, I flew a drone. These are the images I captured that were sent to me and uh, modern technology is an amazing thing. Outside of the drone shots and the fisheye lens, all the images, video and photos in this video were done on my cell phone, the iPhone 16. For the sake of brevity, I've left out most of what we did on this tour, but thank you very much to James and Abby and to all the people on the tour, and hope to see you again.